Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, count ways to build good strings. We're given the integers zero, one, low, and high. It's a little bit misleading because zero and one are variables, but the values might not necessarily be zero and one. Like in this example, we can see low is three, high is also three, zero is one, and one is also one. Our goal here is to build some strings. The restrictions are that these strings must be of length between the value low and high inclusive. So in this case, our low value is three and our high value is also three. So therefore all the strings that we generate have to be exactly of length three. Now, if high happened to be four, then we would have a bit more flexibility. Our strings could be of length either three or four. If we had high value of five, we'd have even more flexibility. Another restriction here is that the strings are gonna be made up of characters, but the characters can only be the zero character or the one character. The last restriction is that any time we append a zero to the string, we have to append it this many times, whatever that variable happens to be equal to. In this case, it's equal to one. So every time we add a zero character to our string, we have to just add a single one at a time. Now that's very, very flexible because we can have a single zero, we could have two zeros, three, four, or we could you know go back to having one. So this is kind of like the infinite amount of flexibility. Now, if zero happened to be equal to two, then we could only add two two zeros at a time into our string. The exact same is true for the one character, and we have a variable to tell us how many ones we pretty much have to add consecutively each time we add a one. In this case, the value is equal to one, but let's say it happened to be equal to two. That's a bit of a better example. Then in that case, we could only add two ones at a time. So we'd have to do it like this. And if we wanted to have a couple more ones, we could do it like this, but we would never be able to have three consecutive ones and then a zero because it's just not possible if we have to append two at a time. Knowing all of that, we just want to count the number of strings we can build using these rules. Before you get into the problem, before you write a single line of code, try to think about what they're asking us here. The single most important observation here is that we do not build the strings. We do not actually have to build the strings. Remember, they're not asking us to build the strings. They're asking us to count the number of strings. It might be possible that we are forced to build the strings in order to count them, but that's actually not true in this case. And let me tell you exactly why. This is all about the decisions that we can make, which might sound familiar if you've been watching my videos up until this point. And they tell us we really have two choices, either append in this example, which I'm actually going to change. I'm going to change this example to say two zeros at a time and two ones at a time. So knowing that we have two choices, we can either start our string with two zeros or we can start our string with two ones. We made two choices. Now let me ask you one very, very simple question. Is it possible that going down this left decision tree or going down this right decision tree, is it possible that either of these paths are gonna lead to duplicate solutions? Take a second to think about it because the answer here is no, they will never lead to duplicate solutions. And I'll tell you exactly why. If I start one of my strings with zero, zero, and I start another string with one, one, and now I can't remove characters from either of these strings. I can't do that. I can only continue to add characters here or add characters here. Is it ever possible that these strings are gonna be equal? Of course not. By definition, look at it. The first character is not equal unless we change one of the first characters, they're never gonna be equal. So these will not lead to duplicate solutions. At this point, you should understand how to solve this problem using backtracking. Well, at least if you are familiar with backtracking as a concept, if you've never used it before, then of course you won't be able to figure it out by yourself. Okay, so knowing that, what else can we notice about this problem? Well, if we don't actually have to compare the strings, we don't have to keep track of what character is what character in each position, what should we keep track of? I mean, how do we know that these two paths are different? How do we still count the number of strings? Well, 
The only thing we need to keep track of here is the length of the string, because remember, that was kind of the big thing they were asking of us. Every string we generate should be of length in the range from low to high. Therefore, the length definitely needs to be stored. We need to keep track of that. So I'm going to have a single variable, which I guess I'll call count, but maybe length would be better. So let's do that. Let's actually just call it length. And in this case, we started with a length of zero here, and I'm not going to be keeping track of these two strings. I'm going to be keeping track of the length, which here is going to be two. And what about over here? It's also going to be two. And when I go down this decision tree, I have two more choices. Add two zeros, add two ones. That gives us a length of four or gives us a length of four. Same thing over here. Get a length of four or a length of four. But hold on, what's the difference between these two paths? The answer is nothing. But wait a minute, then why are we doing this repeated work in the first place? Well, technically, these two paths will lead to different solutions, not duplicate, different solutions. And remember, that's what we're trying to count all the number of different good strings. So we kind of do have to go down both of these branches, but aren't these branches both going to return the exact same value? Yes. So therefore, this is repeated work. Let's just do one of them. And notice here, two fours. Why do I need two of them? One of them is repeated work. I'm not going to do that. And now you can kind of see that this big decision tree is actually going to turn in to a linked list. That's the idea behind memoization. We took a backtracking problem, which was two to the power of n, where I believe n is the high value that they're giving us because that's going to be the height of the tree. We took this and turned it into a big O of n problem. And I'll show you how to code that up with memoization in just a second. But that's the main optimization we made. Once you understand the things that I mentioned now, the problem becomes easy. The only thing left for us to discuss are what are the base cases, because they're not super trivial in this case, because we're not just looking for a string that's exactly a certain length. The string could be actually in a range. So what we're going to do here is once our length, of course, when our length exceeds the high value, that's a base case where we would return zero because that's an invalid string and it's never going to be valid ever again. But whenever we get a string that is actually in that range, then we might want to return a one value, but we're not going to be quite done yet. We're going to say one plus the recursive result of the two recursive branches, because it's possible that let's say our low range is maybe two and our high range is maybe equal to five. We found a string of length two, but maybe we can continue to build a few more strings that are maybe of length four and maybe another one of length five. These are also valid strings, so we want to make sure to count them. I think this is enough for us to now code this up. So like I mentioned, we're going to do this recursively. I like to call it DFS. You can call it whatever you'd like, helper or something. We're just keeping track of a single parameter, which is the length of our current string. All of the other parameters will be accessible within this inner function. And the main base case, yes, is if the length is greater than the high value. In that case, we return zero. Otherwise, we want to compute our result, which is the number of good strings. And actually, before we even get into that they told us that the number could be so large that we want to return it modded by this number, which is 10 to the power of nine plus seven, which I think is just a really big prime number. So we have to make sure that whatever result we return within this DFS, we mod that by the mod value. Now let's actually compute the result. Remember what I said, if the length happens to be in the valid range, which basically means if our count or if our length is greater than or equal to the low value, then we want our result to be set to one for now. The reason I only have to check if it's greater than the low value is because I already checked if the length is greater than the high value. If it was, we would have returned. So we know if we get to this point that the length is not greater than the high value. So if this string is valid, we set the result to one for now. If it's not valid, we set it to zero for now. And then to this result, I want to add a couple more. I want to add DFS of the current length plus 
zero because that's how many characters we can add. That's how many zero characters we can add. And we have a separate branch for DFS of the one character. So we say length plus one, whatever that integer value happens to be. And once this is computed, we just go ahead and return it. Well, I guess I already have that return statement down there. And this is actually the entire backtracking solution. When we call our DFS, we probably want to start with an initial length of zero because we haven't really built our string yet, but this will give you time limit exceeded. Remember, we are solving repeated problems. We're doing repeated work. We can store the result of those repeated problems in a data structure, like an array, in this case, a one dimensional array, or in my case, I like to use a hash map. So what I'm going to say here is a second base case. If this length has already been computed before, or this sub problem has already been computed before, meaning this key is stored in our DP hash map, then I'm just gonna return the value that we happen to store. And if it's not stored, then we should probably store it. So basically I'm gonna replace this result variable with DP of length. So just like that, like that, and then modding it as well. So see how easy that was. And let me just go ahead and run this to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes, it does. And it's pretty efficient. I know a lot of people like to also see the dynamic programming tabulation method as well. So I'll quickly show my code for that. But the idea is pretty similar to the last two leak code problems we've solved. So I won't go super in depth, but it's basically us computing the values that we computed uh, down here in our TP hash map, but we're doing it in a certain order. In this case, my base case is zero is the key value and the count is one. Basically in our cache case, the length is the key. The length of the string is the key, which is mapped to the number of strings we can generate of that length. And we have to kind of start with a base case. So I'm just putting it at the beginning of that array. Technically I'm using a hash map here, but you can think of it as a one dimensional array. We could have also iterated in reverse order where we would have done the opposite, where we would have initialized this as our high value is the base case which is set to one. That's kind of what we did down here, but usually it's more straightforward to iterate through an array left to right. Then we just continue to solve those sub problems, which is for this length, how many strings can we generate? Well, let's get that value from our hash map if it's already stored. And in this case, I'm doing I minus one, even though down here I did length plus one, because in this case we are iterating from left to right. So the result of previous sub problems will be stored towards the left. So that's why we do subtraction here. But like I said, if you iterate through this range in reverse order, you can change it around to be plus. And then this is the second sub problem, of course. And the second parameter zero here comes from the fact that maybe this is an invalid key. And if it is an invalid key, then we just wanna return a value of zero from here. This allows us to not have an extra if statement to check if this is out of bounds. And then we sum those two up and then mod them similar to what we did down here and then store that in our DP cache. This looks kind of complicated. So actually let me write this from scratch. We know, like I said, this is what our hash map represents. But what we want to return is the number of good strings that is of length from low to high. So we're not just returning DP of high. That only tells us how many strings are of length high. We want the number of strings in that range. So of course you can add them up with a for loop like in a traditional language like Java, but in Python, you can kind of do something cool like this. So for I in range from low to high plus one, the plus one comes from the fact that this is non-inclusive in Python. And what we want for that range is to get each value from DP using I as the length, as the key for our hash map. And we're going to add these all to an array. And then for that array, we're going to sum up all the values inside of that array. If you're not a fan of Python, you probably hate what I'm doing right now, but it just feels so good to type this out, at least until I wake up tomorrow and have to write Java at work. But I'll quickly run this code to show you that it also works. Actually, one thing I forgot here is we want to make sure to mod this by the mod value up here. So now let's run it. And as you can see, yes, it works and it's pretty efficient. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. It has a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.